Contrary to um, popular opinion in the church, I, I do sometimes think, and, and recently, thank, thank you, that, that calms me down and you laugh, so can you, you know, can you laugh, even if it's not funny, you laugh anyway, I'm, you know, we're okay. And I realise that I've been attending this church for almost 30 years. Wow. I mean, I know I don't look old enough, but, but you know, I was very young uh, when I came, you understand. And during that time, I've undertaken various roles and tasks. And these ranged from leading the youth group through to cleaning the toilets, uh, discovering badger sets in the back garden, and, and helping to run a food bank. Now, I know you're not, because I can see you all look you know, very intelligent people, but I'm one of those people who occasionally does silly things. And, and, and while the church was having the lift installed uh, many years ago, um, you could only enter the building through a, a side entrance which is behind the high street shops. On one infamous occasion, I'd been here quite late the night before, and I woke about 1 a.m., convinced that I'd left some fan heaters on in the church the evening before. With visions of the church burning to the ground as the fan heaters overheated, I quickly pulled on a shell suit over my pyjamas. If you don't know what a shell suit is, ask somebody who's over 50, they'll explain. Shell suits were a crime against fashion. Um, and, and, and I sped round to the high street, snuck behind the shops, and let myself into the church. And of course, when I got in, guess what? The heaters were switched off. It was only later, as I arrived home, that I realised that it was fortunate that no one saw me skulking around behind the shops and decided to call the police. You can imagine the scene, can't you? Um, let me get this straight, sir. You decided to call in at the church at 1.30 in the morning, dressed only in your pyjamas and a shell suit. It would not have gone down well, wouldn't it? Would it? It would have been the end of, of, of you know, an illustrious career in the king's way. But of all the roles that I've undertaken in the church over the years, the one that I'm involved with now is my favourite. And that's the reason why I'm standing here this morning. Let me explain. One morning, after taking early retirement, a uh, very uh, early retirement, uh, I decided to, to walk to church and walk home with Linda, my wife. Linda was helping in one of our toddler groups. So I came in and I sat down at the back as they were singing the final song with the moms and carers who were waving a nylon parachute up and down with the kiddies running in and out the bottom of it. And, and you know what it's like, nylon? It generates electricity, doesn't it? So all their hairs going up and down under there. And they're having a whale of a time. And then they started singing the song, I Know Jesus Loves Me, which includes the line, I know he loves little ones as much as he loves dads and mums. Not exactly Shakespeare, is it? But the looks on the faces of those little ones just held me. And I was hooked. Well... I've been helping ever since as a sort of honorary granddad. Or as one of the youngsters once called me, I'm that grown-up boy from Toddler Praise, from the toddler group. Some would question the grown-up bit. But that's a bit unkind, isn't it? Paul, I hope you're listening. Uh, that's why I get on so well with the little ones. I think they've worked out. They're not very bright, so they humour me by playing peepo all morning. You know, they think, well, it's poor old boy, you know. But we'll, we'll, we'll humour him. Many of the mums and little ones that were there that first morning that I was there now attend this church. We're working it out. It's virtually all of that group. Now I'm looking around because one or two of you are sitting here this morning and now in this church for various reasons. And the toddler team would like to think that all the mums, occasional dads and carers that come each week are part of the Kingsway family. That's certainly how we see them. So I'm delighted to be part of this service this morning because it was the toddlers, of course, that I met Laura, Jack, and Finn. And in the first few weeks after he was born, Finn wasn't putting weight on, was he? And as a group, we were all very concerned that he would soon begin to gain weight. Each week when Laura and Finn arrived at the group, having come round from the clinic, we would ask, any change? Has he put on weight? And then the wonderful morning when his weight started to increase and there was much rejoicing in the group that week. And so today, 
after several delays, I think two years at least, we've been trying, this has been in the planning. And today we celebrate with Laura, Paul and the family as we've asked God's blessing on Finn. In addition to waving a parachute around at the toddler group, we sing songs and these songs stick in your brain. You know, this is great until you get into Sainsbury's later and you burst into song in the middle of Sainsbury's Isle. It can be most embarrassing with people looking at you. Also, each week, the toddler group leader, Liz, reads us a story. Usually a well-known Bible story, a kiddie-friendly Bible story. In fact, the whole of the Bible is a story. Oh, no, I mean, it's not true. This story is fact, not fiction. It's a story of a God who created a beautiful world. It's a love story. Because into this world he placed two people who he created to have relationship with him, to love and to be loved. It's a history of a people who lived their lives many years ago and the choices that they made and the consequences of these often poor choices. The first words of the Bible are, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the world in which we live. And it was good. He then created two people, Adam and Eve, to live in this perfect environment. You know, there was no climate emergency. There was no war in Ukraine. There was no debt crisis. It was a perfect world. But then sin entered the world. This perfect world that God had created. Sin entered this perfect world as this couple rebel against God. And the Bible continues with the story. It tells the story of one family that God chose to be an example to the world of what trusting him looks like. Someone has described the rest of the Bible as like the underground, a journey from shepherd's bush to king's cross. The shepherd was a guy called Moses who was called by God through a burning bush to lead his people, the Jews, out of a time of slavery in Egypt to the land that he had promised to a man named Abraham many years before. But this family continued to have a turbulent relationship with God. When they listened to the messengers that God sent them to warn them, they prospered. But all too often, they ignored God and went their own way. And disaster followed. Among the warnings were promises. There were promises of someone who would come in the future. Someone who would restore their relationship with God. And who would this person be? A mighty warrior to give them a kingdom here on earth? No. It would be a baby whose birth we're going to celebrate in a month's time. A baby born into poverty. A child who grew into a man, Jesus, who would know what it was like to work as a tradesman, but who also know just who he was and where he came from. Jesus told stories. The prodigal son, the good Samaritan, a farmer scattering his seed, a man who built his house upon the rock. How did he relate to children? Children at that time were not particularly valued as they are today. And one day, some parents brought their little children to Jesus so he could touch them and bless them. But when the disciples saw this, they scolded the parents for bothering him. Then Jesus called for the children and said to the disciples, let the children come to me, don't stop them. For the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these. These children, I tell you the truth. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never receive it, will never enter it. So what's happening here? The parents are doing what many Jewish children, parents did. At the time, they would have brought their children to a rabbi, a teacher, to receive a blessing for their children, just as we've been doing this morning, as Paul and Laura have brought Flynn, Finn to be blessed. The disciples 
trying to protect Jesus perhaps from the demands of the crowd, tried to send the children away, but Jesus rebukes them and welcomes the children. Let them come, he says. Don't stop them. Then he speaks those puzzling words. For the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Oh, what does that mean? That we must all behave like children. You know, throwing a tantrum when somebody's got something you want. Or eating ice cream until it makes us sick. Or dressing up as a superhero. Or, or a character from Frozen. Is that what it means? No. That's not what Jesus is talking about. We're meant to be childlike, not childish. Did you know that a child, on average, laughs 150 times a day? Wonderful fact for you this morning. Adults, on average, laugh six times. No wonder Jesus said we should be more like children. Children have much more fun, don't they? They take joy in their surroundings and in their activities. Why don't we behave like children? We don't have to behave, but what Jesus is referring to is like a small child without its parents are helpless. It cannot feed itself. A baby instinctively turns to its mother to be fed. It doesn't try to work out how, how its mother produces milk or how baby formula is made. It trusts that it will be fed. A child trusts that its parents will look after and care for it. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. He's not talking about behavior. He's talking about trusting. As a child is helpless without its parents, so are we without God. Some of us may lead better lives than others. But ultimately, none of us can help ourselves from ourselves. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Jesus is the only one to have ever lived a sinless life. And that's what he's saying in this passage. We all like to think we're self-sufficient, don't we? I say that the, the, the most chosen song at funerals is, I did it my way. I did it my way. But the bad news is, we can't save ourselves. But the good news is, that Jesus can. Unless you trust, unless you depend wholly upon God, you will not be able to enter the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus said. What does that mean? It means a fulfilled, abundant life now, and it means eternal life in the future. Jesus, a man, but not just a man. This was God entering the world that he created. The man who was God, who faced all the temptations that we face, yet continued to obey his Father in heaven. The king who would be hung on a cross from shepherd's bush to king's cross. A God who gave his life that we might live. That all the wrong choices that we have made can be forgiven because he paid the ultimate price. By giving his life, he made a way that we can come back into a perfect relationship with God. The relationship that Adam and Eve enjoyed before they disobeyed him. As a famous verse says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever, whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus on the cross took our sins, our wrong choices and made a way for us to receive forgiveness. So what do we have to do? Like a child, we have to receive it. A famous Bible teacher of previous generation was once asked, what's the most important lesson that you've ever learned in all of your years of studying God's Word, the Bible? His questioners were hoping for some deep insight into understanding the Bible. They were looking for something, some fresh revelation of God that they'd never heard before. The man answered with the words of an old song, Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. We're back to the song that grabbed me at Toddler Group. I know Jesus loves me. 
I know he loves little ones as much as he loves dads and moms. And that song ends with the lion. And I know he loves you too. That's the story of the Bible. The love story of God. The story of a God who created this universe, this world, created people to be loved. Yes, Jesus loves little ones. We've seen that in this morning's passage that we've looked at. And he also loves moms and dads. But he also loves you too. But wait a minute. If God loves us so much, why doesn't every story have a happy ending? Why is there so much suffering in the world? That question has puzzled much greater minds than mine. But can I suggest a clue this morning? So possibly they answer. When my younger son Adam was about five, five years old, one Saturday morning we were walking down Mill Lane and he ran on ahead of me, as children do. Suddenly a young lad on a bike came down the lane, lost control of his bike, and it was like a slow motion film. You know what it's like when you see something's about to happen and you can't stop it and I'm shouting, Adam, Adam, watch out the way, and the bike crashes into him. This meant a trip to Russell's Hall Hospital as the bike had cut into his head, cut his head open. After the usual wait, he was examined, and then it was decided he needed stitches. The staff asked me to hold him as they began to stitch the wound. Adam was crying out and looking at me, asking me, Dad, stop them, stop them. And I I wanted to do what any of you would have done, any parent would want to do. I wanted to run out the room with that lad in my arms. And I was feeling, I just don't want this to go on, like any of you would have done well. And I wanted to say to him, while there's breath in my body, I will do everything I can to protect you. Isn't that how we'd all react? But I knew what he didn't know. That he had to go through that to get to the other side. He had to go through the bad stuff to get to the good stuff. He had to have the stitches so that his head would be mended. Before you reach for the tissues... Adam was able to enjoy himself that afternoon at his cousin's party. The only thing that he was upset about was it was a swimming party and he wasn't allowed in the water. Do you think that sometimes when we cry out to God and ask him to take us out of a bad situation and he doesn't appear to answer, that it may be because he knows that for some reason that he knows that we don't know, that we have to go through this bad experience to receive what's on the other side. That he would love to remove us from that situation, but he knows that it's through this experience that we'll come close to him, that, we will have all, that he will have all eternity to wash away the pain that we felt at that moment. Oh, it's okay for God. It's not him going through the suffering. But God does know what we're going through. On the cross, Jesus shouted out to his father, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Jesus knew what it was to feel the silence of God. Because of his suffering, we can be set free from our guilt and shame. The Bible says, let us keep looking to Jesus. Our faith comes from him. And he is the one who makes it perfect. He did not give up when he had to suffer shame and die on a cross. He knew the joy that would be his later. Now he is seated at the right hand of God. What was this joy that he would enjoy later? It was the knowledge that his death meant that we can have eternal life. Because he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. And so will we if we put our trust in him. One more story, and then I'm done. Imagine that you're in a cinema, and you look around, and you see all your family and friends are there, seated around you. The lights dim, and the title comes on the screen. This film will include every word, every action, and every thought of and then your name appears next to it. Every action, every thought, every word that you have ever spoken or even thought or done. 
And what's worse, you notice your mum sitting next to you. In the th I don't know about you. I mean, I know you're all holy people. But I'd be out of there sh sharpish. I'd be on the next plane to South America to hide from the shame. But the good news is that if we trust in Jesus, if we ask him for forgiveness for the stuff that we've done, then the film's wiped clean. The film is wiped clean. No more guilt. No more shame. He died in our place. He took all of our guilt and shame when he died and rose again. So what do we have to do? We have to put our trust in someone we can't see. Someone we can only experience the presence. Too simplistic? Remember what Jesus said, that we have to come to him like children. Trusting, not claiming to know all the answers. Now this morning, we can have three response, responses to this message. We can know that we have already received this forgiveness, that we trust in him with our life, and if that's you, then that's great. Or we can say, I hear what you're saying, but it's not for me. Or, like a trusting child, speaking to its parent, we can ask for his forgiveness. We can have the past wiped clean. We can come into a relationship with him.